E-commerce students, today we are going to be jumping into the backbone and architecture of the internet. We're going to be talking about the actual components that make the internet work, that enable e-commerce, and that enable the kinds of connectivity we take for granted. In other words, you're going to be looking behind the curtain to see what really powers the wizard, if you know that analogy, or I'm dating myself, it could be happening. What are our objectives? Our objectives really are to understand how all these components of the internet function together, to give us things like domains, to give us things like IP addresses, and to allow the internet to serve as an e-commerce platform. We're also going to talk about the difference between client-server computing uh, versus traditional or old-school networks, and how all of this together, centralized computing essentially, enables uh, things like mobile e-commerce. We're going to talk about cloud computing and how that's been an enabler for small portable devices to become powerful parts of e-commerce. We're going to be moving fast in this chapter because a lot of this is important but straightforward. So buckle up and keep your hands and feet inside the ride until it comes to a complete stop. We all like to think we know what the Internet is, but what is the Internet really? The Internet and the World Wide Web are not the same thing. The Internet has been around in one form or another since the 1960s. And it essentially is what we refer to as a self-healing network. It was created by the Department of Defense to have a self-healing network in the event of an atomic war. Well, it transitioned to education in the 70s and 80s and now uh, to the public and to business in the 90s and beyond. The World Wide Web is one of the services that's on the Internet. So think about the Internet being the actual network and the World Wide Web is simply a part of the Internet. It's a part that we're able to, to surf using domains. It's a service that allows us to find content on the web and put it into a graphical form. So remember that. The internet is the actual network. The World Wide Web is one service on it. So where do we start off? Uh, in the 1960s, again, during the midst of the Cold War, the fundamental building blocks were created. Things like IP networking, the theories behind the internet, the actual original first legs of the internet. Uh, then we move past the Department of Defense era into the middle 70s, and all of a sudden we're doing research and large institutions are getting connected. Keep in mind, during those periods of time, if you wanted to connect multiple facilities on a network, you had to literally run copper wire to be able to connect them. The Internet was a way that we could have a network that multiple people could maintain and we could have essentially universal connectivity. But during this period, it was mainly college campuses and some companies, uh, researchers that had access. And then 1995, for points of this class, for the purposes of this class, we say that is the year that e-commerce went mainstream because that's the year when en masse people started getting online. 1995 seems like so recent for some of us. So what are the key concepts behind it? The biggest one that, that really changed the game uh, is IP networking. And the idea being that we could have content that was addressable with numbers similar to telephone numbers that we would be able to access content from anywhere. And IP networking uses a protocol called TCP IP. That's Transmit Control Protocol Internet Protocol. It's essentially the way of addressing pages so that we can get from one place to another on the Internet. And the, the three concepts that made this possible were packet switching, which we're going to discuss in a moment, the actual protocol itself, and the idea of centralized computing. So what is packet switching? When we make a phone call, at least in the old analog telephone era, when you'd hear a dial tone and pick up a phone, that was an analog call, meaning you directly connect one circuit to another. If I was calling you, you couldn't talk to anybody else while we were talking because the circuit was just between the two of us. Packet switching instead uses networks like telephone networks to be able to break up millions of different communications into what we refer to as packets, and they travel between each other. So we're essentially... The analogy I would use, we're breaking things into molecules and breaking them up and then reassembling them. Well, why do we have to do this on the Internet? Because not all information on the Internet takes the same route to get where it ends up, which is also why we use routers. So think of it like this. When we're communicating, and we'll, we'll illustrate this in this chapter as well, when we're communicating, we're breaking our communications down into smaller chunks, spreading out over multiple pathways and reassembling it in the right order on the other end. And it makes better use of our time. So it's the idea being we can have multiple conversations going on at once in and around each other. So let's talk about the difference. In the traditional circuit switched world, 
you could have one computer talking to another at any given point in time. So the computers themselves had to have a linear connection. While one computer is talking to a second, a third cannot communicate. In a packet switch environment, it means we're breaking things up into smaller chunks and essentially pieces of information, packets, are moving in and around each other. So that's the difference. That was the fundamental building block. So in terms of packet switching also got us into digital or binary communications. Anytime we communicate text or images, they're broken into ones and zeros. So every color, every letter in the alphabet, anything we would build on a web page ultimately is broken down to ones and zeros into code. That code is broken down into packets and it's sent from one place to another are perfectly duplicated, perfectly replicated. For example, this is why if you're listening to a, an old record, for example, the needle has to hit the record, we, we hear the content moving in a circle, that's different than the way we listen to a CD, in which a CD is actually translating digital into audio. And that's why, for example, if you're listening to a CD or an MP3 or a digital music file, you can make a perfect copy of it because we're making a copy of the digital code. Analog is hard to copy directly. Digital is not because we're duplicating it based on a code. So the language we use for all this is called Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol. TCP simply means we're determining we're opening a communications channel between two computers. It says where we're going and where we're, where we're, where we're going and where we're coming from. The Internet Protocol is the actual numbers that we use to find the websites. And this protocol, TCP IP, has four layers to it that, that enable us to connect to networks, actually produce information on those networks, and also to make applications happen. So we've got the network interface layer where our computers actually connect to a network. So if you're at home, that's your home Wi-Fi network. We've got the internet layer in which your computer goes from your home into the actual internet. The transport layer sends the packet, sends the communications where it needs to go on the internet. And the application layer is where information involving the actual application you're using, whether you're using email or sending video or, or being involved in a video game, the actual application happens in the application layer. And so again, to, to spell this out, the network interface, whether you are going onto Wi-Fi or an Ethernet cable at the bottom, you're actually connecting to a network. That network connects to the Internet. So I'm here at St. Francis today. I'm connecting into my computer. My computer connects over Wi-Fi, and we're still on the local campus. From there, it goes out to the Internet and the Internet layer. Uh, at, at that point, once the Internet address is assigned, it goes out to the transport layer. It goes out to the bigger world on the Internet. So. The internet layer is given an address, the transport layer takes it out to the bigger world, and the application layer, for example, uh, makes, makes the actual application work. If I were doing a Zoom call with you right now, my laptop would connect to the interface layer, it would give an IP address so I could call you. It would go out on the internet over TCP, and Zoom would actually operate on the top of all of these layers so that we can actually connect. So to break it down, TCP is, is how we connect between the computers on a network and make sure we put these packets in the right order. Internet protocol means we're getting an address to send it to, and the IP address that we're using is a unique address, like a phone number, so we can contact each other on the Internet. So in terms of IP addressing, the, the main takeaway is that when we started, we had shorter addresses. Uh, the original IP addresses, uh, going up to IP4, for example, uh, were, were noted by... Uh, what we referred to as, as 32 bits. And so we had, uh, you know, a total of several million combinations we could put together and we were running out of IP addresses. So we extended the address to be a 128-bit address that allowed for more addressing, one quadrillion to be, uh, to be exact. And I misspoke, IP uh, before the previous version only had 4 billion available, not million, billion. So the, the, the main takeaway is here we made the IP addresses longer so we can have more combinations and more unique addresses. So we talked a little bit about how this works. Transmit Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, TCP IP. When we are breaking content into smaller pieces, we are essentially addressing them in such a way that when they go out on the greater internet and come back to the person that we're sending them to, that they get reassembled in the right order. So a router make sure that the packets get split up and recombined in the right way. And that's what the purpose of routers are. Now you'll notice that in this diagram, 
the different packets, the small dots there are taking different routes. Literally, if you're con connecting to Amazon.com and you're on there for a couple minutes surfing around, your actions that are producing new websites may be traveling different routes on the internet because it's a redundant network. We need routers to be able to reassemble that content. Then we get into really one of the things that made the internet truly accessible to quote unquote normal people, people who are not computer scientists. For example, if you went to Nike.com or if you went to Francis.edu, there's actually an IP address, a number associated with each of those accounts. But nobody wants to remember a string of numbers. It's much easier to remember Nike.com or Francis.edu. That's where we got in to what we refer to domain names and DNS. Domain names simply mean, uh, what is the name of your company on the internet? Are you Nike.com, for example? Are you Francis.edu? And our domain, domain name system means simply that there's a place where those numbers, the IP addresses that are associated with our websites, are registered so that when somebody types in the name, the name corresponds to the number. When we go to a, a website, we go to what we refer to as a URL. That's a uniform resource locator, and it means it's a specific address on the internet, it's a specific web page. The example we have here for azimuthinteractive.com, that's a URL. And the part of that URL that is the domain is Azimuth Interactive. So we have a domain name, and the addresses we use are specific places on the internet. So URLs take us to specific pages. Our domain is the name of our company translated into numbers. Well, another concept that we need to understand, the reason we can carry a tiny phone in our pockets that is as powerful as it is, is because of client-server computing. It basically means that we've got networks that are fast enough that we don't have to lug around giant computers in our pockets. We ex essentially use our phones or our laptops or our tablets as clients that are making use of centralized highly powerful communications processes. That is what is powering the modern internet. We generically refer to this as cloud computing, meaning that all of your, your technology, including your heavy duty processing power, your powerful computers don't exist in your pocket, they exist out in the cloud. And this is client server computing. That's what's enabled the, the mobile platform to take off. When we think about it, uh, right now, for example, we can watch videos, we can do shopping, we can do just about anything, uh, video calls on our, our iPhones because of cloud computing, because of client-server computing. This was a very disruptive technology. When, when the iPhone first hit in 2007, it wasn't the first smartphone, but it was the one that really took off, the one that people could resonate with because it was fun, it was capable, and it was taking things to the next level. It was a disruptive technology, particularly for the growth of the PC industry and for conventional telephones. And now, at this point in time, it's a very common part of reality for most people. So when we talk about uh, cloud, cloud computing and client-server computing, what this also means is a lot of the things we would normally have to have run locally, we can now put out in the cloud. The best example I can think of are uh, things like email. In the old days, you would have maintained an email server for your own company, and highly secure companies still do, but a lot of folks just subcontract to Microsoft or Google because the networks are powerful enough that why would we maintain that in-house? We refer to that as, as software as a service. If you are not maintaining any of your own in-house computing, perhaps you outsource your entire infrastructure. Your telephones and everything can be infrastructure as a service. And platform as a service means you might not even have much in the way of software on your own computer, but you're logging into a terminal. For example, if I can use a, uh, a Google Chromebook, which has a very minimal operating system, and I can still do all my work remotely, the platform might actually be a platform as a service. And we've got all kinds of types of clouds. Some companies maintain their own cloud computing. Some people use uh, hybrids, a little of both, and some uh, completely maintain their own systems out in the cloud. Highly secure environments, for example, might not trust Microsoft or Google. So what are the drawbacks? Uh, all this sounds great, right? Saving costs, increased speed, centralized capability. The drawbacks are you're losing some level of control. And anytime you are putting things out in the cloud, there is always a chance of somebody else uh, getting access to it. The flip side is, who wants to maintain their own servers if they don't have to? It's, it's, a, it's a very big cost-saving measure, and it's something a lot of companies that wouldn't have done this 15 years ago, 10 years ago, are now all about it. 
So let's draw some context. I love putting up 2014 stats because it was the first year I taught this class. If we go back to that point in time, uh, now most Americans had cell phones, but hardly anybody had smartphones compared to now. We're talking about 60% of the population. People were into e-readers and they had tablets, but not so much with smartphones. If we go to 2021, the most recent stats I have, you're talking almost 9 out of 10 people have a smartphone, and we know from our previous discussions that a lot of people are purchasing with them. Fewer people are using e-readers and tablets, uh, but more people are using smartphones. What else is driving this revolution? We're seeing now that more people are just saying, why am I using a company computer? I'm bringing my own computer to work, which means I can also do things like private and personal web browsing and the office. We're also seeing that more of our non-computer devices are becoming computers, our cars, our refrigerators, even our billboards. We're seeing now that a lot of these things are essentially smart connected devices, and we refer to that as the Internet of Things. Well, there are other protocols uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but you need to know that they enabled a lot of good things to happen on the Internet. We talked about HTTP, a uh, hypertext protocol, which basically gave us the, idea, the ability to create uh, universal web pages. Email servers, uh, whether you're using SMTP, uh, POP, or IMAP, they're based on standards. And that means no matter what kind of email you have, we can exchange email with each other. And we've got things like file transfer protocol. Uh, prior to really quick internet connections, a lot of people, for example, were using FTP to establish sessions so they could exchange files online. And again, a secure socket layer, we're going to be talking about that in a security chapter, the idea that there are ways to have more secure communications. We've also got utility programs as well. For example, Ping and Tracert, uh, Trace, or also known as Traceroute, means you can track how, how traffic moves across the internet. So in terms of the infrastructure itself, because this is not a networking class, it's not even a computer science class, we are going to be covering this at a very superficial layer. We know that we talked about the four layers uh, of IP networking, for example. We're going to talk about the hourglass uh, approach here in terms of the, the way that the network actually communicates, the way networks generally communicate, and how there's a bottleneck in the middle. I think this is best when it's illustrated. For example, we know our layer one, uh, we're talking about physical connections to the internet. We know when we get to layer two, we're talking about actually the, the IP connection, the, the place we go from physical network connection to getting out on the internet. When we get to middleware, uh, in the middle, we see the transportation services and representation standards. Why is that in an hourglass? That's where traffic slows down. For example, if we're on the local network here at St. Francis University, we've got a very robust network and things move very quickly. When you get to the Internet, however, because the Internet itself is a shared network, it's going to slow down based on overall usage. And what else slows us down? The amount of storage we have available, the amount of security, the more you're asking, uh, to move over a network. For example, if you're doing security, if you're doing SSL, if you're requiring encryption, all of that eats up your available bandwidth. The best way to look at it is if we are thinking about uh, the internet as a pipe, only so much water will th fit through the pipe at any given point in time. And if everybody wants the water, there's less to go around. And so things like security, Things like encryption take more of that water, and the pipe is only so big. If we go to layer four, where, where the things that we're hitting on the internet are, whether they're the actual uh, web browsers, whether it's media players, etc., all that stuff on the top, again, is limited by the connection. So on the bottom, just to give you some context, here I am on my local internet connection in St. Francis University, my local network connection. I'm going out to the big bad internet, but so is everybody else. I have to use all of these things to get out to the internet. How much storage I've got left on my computer or RAM, for example. How many security uh, aspects I need to go through. And I want to browse the web. I want to check my email. I want to watch videos. All of these are based somewhere else, meaning I'm accessing somebody else's server. And ultimately, it's going to be slowed down by the hourglass in the middle. So in terms of how all this works, once we get out of our local area, once we get out of our, our office or our CAN, CAN stands for Campus Area Network, we've got some sort of connection to the greater Internet. You might have, in the old days, something called a T1 line. The, the bottom line is everybody on this office or on this campus is going out to one shared connection to the Internet. 
That shared connection of the internet goes out to a bigger host who distributes internet, who goes out to a regional hub, ultimately to the backbone. And this is something that not a lot of people realize, but most of the major backbones of the internet are located in big cities. For example, during 9-11, back in 2001, we had major internet disruptions on the East Coast because the Twin Towers were hit in New York, and many major communications pipelines, IXPs, went through those areas. It took a long time to get them reconnected. So again, you could have really, really fast speeds in your local network. You're communicating between computers and file storage locally, but when you get out past your connection to the internet, it could slow down based on the overall size of your pipeline to the internet, but also based on the amount of people that are on it at any given point in time. Here at St. Francis, we go out on a fiber connection between Loretto PA to our IXP, which is at Carnegie Mellon, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, which is connected directly to the backbone of the internet. In the same manner, when you buy home internet, whether you're buying from Atlantic Broadband or Comcast or BreezeLine or Verizon, all of that goes out to your local provider who's either connecting you through DSL or cable or Fios to your home network. And these tend to be smaller connections than what go to businesses as well. So you've got multiple places where your connection can slow down. The internet backbone itself, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this other than to say it's generally fiber optic because it's the fastest potential way to move uh, data. Fiber optics, which is essentially moving at the speed of light. And we call those tier one internet service providers. Those are people who are actually connected to the main backbones of the internet. And we get between here and Europe, for example, with undersea links. There's many, many connections to the internet all over. Internet exchange points essentially are, are where regional connections get back to those tier ones. So for example, if our regional connection here was Verizon, Verizon gets connected back to a major main leg of the internet, someplace like, like CMU. And again, I'm not expecting you to know all this stuff verbatim, but just know there's multiple steps and tiers of internet connectivity. So in terms of the, uh, the retail providers, uh, th these are folks, whether it's Comcast, AT&T, whoever's in your neighborhood, essentially they're reselling internet that they're getting from tier two and tier one providers. And then we also have places, for example, that are not covered well by major providers. And you might even have a local independent company. They tend to have slower service, for example. And, th and the ways that we get connected at home, we talk about narrowband, we're talking about essentially people who are using dial-up internet. You get to broadband, it's anything that gets into multiple megabits per second, that's broadband. And the, the broadband can take multiple forms. For example, digital subscriber line, DSL, that's essentially using old analog telephone lines to move internet. It's not as potentially fast as cable. Cable is literally using coaxial cable, the same cable that car carries television signals into your house. It can carry faster speeds. And then you got satellite internet, which works pretty well for downloads, but not so good for uploads. And so, again, where you live is going to depend, uh, where you, the, your amount of your connectivity is going to depend a lot of the time where you live. So the campus area networks, again, they can be fast because we locally have control of our networks. Again, we have uh, at St. Francis, all of our buildings are networks and your offices, they're all networked. It's only competing with local traffic. Your local area network essentially allows everybody in your organization to connect to each other and to a centralized internet connection. And again, it comes down to the idea that what is locally happening might be faster than your actual connection to the internet. Then we get into mobile internet access. We're either talking about things like cellular networks or we're talking about Wi-Fi. Here's the difference. Wi-Fi uh, when you get into a, a campus, for example, Wi-Fi ties back to a, a centralized internet connection where a cellular connection goes out to a tower. What a lot of people don't realize when you're connecting to cellular internet, cellular internet, the speeds can vary based on things like how many leaves are on the trees. It can vary based on weather patterns, and it can vary based on how many people are actually connected in any given point in time. All wireless communications at some level is line of sight. Our local area networks uh, at this point in time are using what we refer to as 802.11. All this means is that these are low power connections, which means they're not licensed by the FCC. Anybody can put up a, a Wi-Fi access point, and it takes more than to cover an area because it's not licensed spectrum. 
WiMAX, again, is, is a wider range and more powerful form of Wi-Fi that's starting to roll out, and we all know how Bluetooth works. In terms of, of Wi-Fi, again, if you're getting Wi-Fi at home, ultimately, you've got all your computers and tablets connecting to an access point that then goes out to the Internet. If your Internet is out, you still might be able to connect to your local access point, but the reason you're not getting out is because the local connection is working, but not the larger connection. So what are we looking at now? We've got large swaths of the world, for example, that don't have good connectivity. And so there's ways that, that providers are trying to, to counter this. Google actually has something called Project Loon, where they're experimenting with using balloons, essentially, as access points. You can put up high-altitude balloons that will beam Wi-Fi down to people on the ground. Uh, Facebook is trying to do something similar with other kinds of aircraft, including drones. And again, Microsoft also has, has the idea of doing something similar to what Google is doing. All of these companies want to get internet into places like the developing world. Why? So they can build more customers to their services. Then we have the Internet of Things. And again, this is a trend that started a while ago, but it's really kind of hitting its zenith now with things like smart televisions, for example, smart refrigerators. And th this is really going to be where we're headed over the next period of time because, for example, just the, the very fact that most people have a ring camera at home that they can access from their smartphone indicates we're doing an awful lot on the Internet that does not involve using a personal computer anymore. And so all of these things are becoming standards-based now. So, for example, there are light fixtures you can buy that are compatible with Alexa. What are the security concerns? A lot of companies have not put a lot of time into locking this equipment down. Let me give you an example. In terms of uh, progressive insurance, rolled out something called Snapshot, which you could agree to have your driving, uh, your driving habits monitored by satellite to determine if you're a safe driver. If you're a safe driver, you get a discount. Uh, what progressive didn't tell you was that their system was completely unencrypted and could actually result in a hacker getting into your car's computer. So sometimes the security is not thought through all that well. We're going to see also when we get to our chapter in security, some providers uh, of smart televisions, including LG and Vizio, have actually ended up having to pay out class lock action lawsuits for listening to consumers. If you wonder sometimes if your smart TV is listening to you because your YouTube ads seem to change based on what you're talking about, you might not be dreaming it. So who ultimately controls the Internet? The answer is there's not one company that does. If we had to point it down, if you had to answer the question, who has the most control, it would be ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. This was a, an international, uh, multinational group, I should say, that came about in the 90s, that really, uh, or I should say, came to prominence in the 90s to assign IP addresses, blocks of IP addresses, and help to manage domains. It is still based out of the United States and still largely controlled by U.S. interests. There have been some movements to make it more internationally based uh, and folks who are security advocates in the United States are pushing back against letting that happen. I'm not going to read all of these other entities to you other than to say nobody really owns the internet and to some extent it's very cooperative but if there is one company that has a disproportionate amount of control of what's on the internet it would be ICANN. So the, the question we're running into and so it's a big one these days how free is internet access? For example, if Google's operating in China uh, and, and somebody's using Google China, you, you can't get information on Tiananmen Square, which was a massacre of college students back in the 1980s. So is it okay for, for companies who are based in the U.S. to be monitoring and censoring internet? In terms of surveillance in general, uh, whether it's social networks, whether it is our internet service providers, we in the United States do not enjoy an Internet user's Bill of Rights. There is no guaranteed privacy in the Internet. And the second part of it, although many of us download software and apps that require us clicking on terms of service, terms of use, very few people actually read them. And so how do we control the flow of information over different rules in different countries? The answer is it's not simple. So what are some of the limitations of our current Internet? It's still a shared network. There are still people who do not have access to broadband. Uh, we've got limited selection of providers. For example, uh, we, we like to talk about a free market. and Competition builds innovation. Most Americans don't have a, a wide open uh, market for Internet. They've got one, maybe two or three providers they can pick from. And the choices aren't always great if you don't live in a metropolitan area. 
again, if you look at why rural service stinks so bad, it's because there's no cost model. If you're a large internet service provider, are you going to invest money into areas with limited potential returns? Probably not, and the infrastructure is expensive. Those are some of our limitations. So we talk about the first and last mile. Uh, the first mile is where we connect to the big internet, the big IXPs, for example. The last mile is where it makes it to your house. And that oftentimes is the place where things get slow. Why? Well, in the first mile, it's all fiber optics. By the time it gets to my house in rural Pennsylvania, it might be copper and it might be wireless. So the, the idea of fiber optics, we've got a movement now for things like Fios, the idea that we're going to be putting more fiber optic services into residential areas. But it's some time off yet, and there's got to be a cost model to be able to get people this kind of service. The web itself, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the web itself is a service on the Internet, and it really came into prominence between 1989 and 1991. I love looking back at that. I was in high school at the time, and the first GUI uh, web browser graphical user interface was Mosaic, which would later become Firefox. And it was developed to run on any operating system at the time. So it was, it was, it was agnostic to operating systems. Then we get to 94, Netscape Navigator. Again, the precursor to Firefox came out. And finally, Microsoft made history in 95 when they rolled out Internet Explorer, which was their first web browser and was built into Windows 95. The reason the Internet was the first part of things is because the government needed a communications network. The web made it accessible to people through something we call hypertext. And hypertext simply meant you could have links, and if you could click on them through a graphical user interface, you could navigate the web. All of a sudden, you didn't need addresses or to write code to be able to navigate the Internet. We take that for granted, but this is why touch screens are so popular today, because of what happened with hypertext. HTML, hypertext markup language, gave us a universal way to make web pages. And cascading style sheets simply meant you could make one web page and have templates for other pages. The current version right now is HTML5, which is more capable because it can do things like animation. And then we get into XML, which is primarily used for smartphone development. And it was meant for, for, for less complicated, more rapid development of web pages. So to, to break it down, H, XML and HTML both were designed for different reasons. XML was meant to, to carry data. So in other words, it's basically saying, I'm going to create web pages uh, dynamically on things like smartphones. And HTML was meant to make sure pages look consistently consistent. So they had different ideas in mind. XML is more guidance. HTML is more appearance. And for the purposes of this class, that's about as much as you need to know. We start talking about web servers and web clients. We talk about client server computing. Web server software is basically what allows a computer to accept requests from other computers and create web pages. If you are building your own server, you can use something like Apache uh, to, to, to build your server and it will honor requests. For example, a, a typical web server also will have FTP, file transfer protocol, will register with a search engine, will also have some level of security. Uh, the, that's the software. The web server itself is the physical hardware. And that can actually be a physical server, or these days it can be based on software on a server with, uh, with virtual operating systems. Again, beyond the, the reach of this class, just know that the term web server is interchangeable between software and hardware. And then you might have servers that are specialized, one that runs ads or runs a database, for example. They have different reasons to exist. Anything we use to access a page on the Internet is a client. Again, going back to smartphones. Clients are the small, low-profile parts of the equation, and the processing power is centralized. That's how we're able to have smartphones. So in terms of the web, web pages, or sorry, web browsers and their popularity, this is what our text says. And I think I would, would say that these stats maybe are a little off. By the time of this printing, I think Google Chrome probably has even more of the market. However, at the time of recording, uh, we're also seeing now that Microsoft's Bing uh, has just uh, been AI enabled, which means more people may be going to Microsoft Edge. By the time we revisit these statistics, for example, we may be talking about different web browsers. Most of the people using Safari obviously are iPhone users, but a lot of iPhone users still use Chrome as well. 
So what are some of the features of, of the internet and the web? Obviously, the idea of being able to communicate, email, et cetera, is something that changed the game. Search engines. If you use Google, for example, you're not necessarily searching the whole internet. You're searching an index of the web. We get into some of these things like streaming media. Again, we're going to talk about the impact of that and how things have changed. Let's dive into this a little bit. The most common form of communications on the internet, believe it or not, 2023 and beyond is still email uh, and instant messaging. Uh, again, we're, we're seeing more people making calls over the internet, and of course, we saw the explosion of things like Zoom over uh, over the uh, the pandemic. The, the key thing I want you to remember about search engines, and we'll repeat this when we get into more about Google, search engines are not absolutely checking everything on the internet. Search engines search their index of what's on the internet. In a couple of slides, we're going to hit to how Google actually works. But these are the top ones. And again, by this time next year, when I, I do this lecture again, Bing may be the top, especially with the power of AI behind them. How does Google work? Essentially, Google, and I won't read this diagram to you because I'm going to hopefully have you watch a video about this as well. Essentially, web pages exist. Google's web crawlers are constantly checking web pages based on new terms or existing search terms. And Google indexes these terms to say these are the pages where these these terms show up and when you do a Google search based on their algorithm of what is credible what pages show up with the same terms the most which pages are most likely to contain high quality information it's an algorithm that they don't share with the public that's what's going to populate the top 10 search results in Google so again if you remember two things from this slide Number one, Google is an index of the web. It's not an actual search of the web. So Google is searching its index of the web. And pages end up being ranked in those indexes based on an algorithm that Google does not share with the public, but is likely based on things like quality of content, uniqueness of terms, and the number of times people are hitting that page. Again, it's not always a straight answer. What's so special about Google, even in our time now, it was the first search engine to do this. It was the first one to look at how people were ranking searches, how they were cross-connecting. And the other part about Google these days in terms of dominance, most people don't go past the first page or the second page of search results. It's important to make the front page. Obviously, we've been talking about the power of streaming and, and why this stuff is so important. Uh, at this point in time, uh, basically because of client server computing and, and faster networks, all of a sudden we don't need to own physical media. This is why Netflix and Disney Plus and Spotify and all these things have taken off, why they even work well on small, thin clients such as our, our smartphones. Some statistics, again, this, this stat's a couple years old, uh, but basically they're, they're predicting, this was a prediction from several years ago, Cisco is predicting by the time we hit to, to 2022, 2023, that about eight out of every 10 packets on the internet, 82% of internet traffic is going to be uh, essentially people downloading or watching video. Again, these, these numbers are 2019 numbers, but Netflix was the, the, uh, the number one single provider of, uh, uh, or user of, of bandwidth and next to HTTP stream media. And all that means is any way that people are consuming media that's not Netflix all gets correlated in that blue uh, column on the right. What does that mean is Netflix essentially is equivalent in use to all other types of downloads essentially. Uh, Netflix, YouTube, uh, you can see how this stacks up. Netflix was the number one single media company. At the time of publication, this was uh, the top 10 uh, streaming services. Netflix still has 225 million users and growing. But even uh, groups like Hulu, we think of Hulu being a big company, they still have a fraction of Netflix's subscribers. We are living right now in Web 2.0, probably heading to 3.0 soon. Keep in mind, Web 1.0, back from 95 to the mid-2000s, meant that most people didn't have websites. They might be using email and browsing the web, but they weren't actively producing content. Now, thanks to things like blogs and social networks, more people are. What does this mean? We are in the interactive period uh, of, of the internet, and with what we're seeing emerge with artificial intelligence, we're going to be entering a new layer of, of internet, a new era, where essentially our ways of doing things are going to be augmented by computers and AIs. 
again, speaking of, of uh, augmented reality, we're seeing now that the companies like Facebook are investing big time on the idea of doing virtual or augmented reality games. Uh, it was, it's a few years old now, but when we think about Pokemon Go, the reason why that was such a noteworthy achievement is because that led companies like Google to realize they could do augmented reality with things like maps. What does that mean? By using things like geofencing and seeing augmented reality, for example, I could have targeted advertising coming to people through Google Maps, through wearable computers, things like goggles, the idea that we could translate things that are happening in, a cy in cyberspace into the real world as well. And that gets us into where we are headed with mixed reality. That also brings us to the point now, again, with AI that is, is becoming more and more powerful. Almost everybody who owns a smartphone is making use of some kind of AI, whether you're using Siri or Alexa. We are using intelligent types of devices to help us run our lives, schedule things, schedule meetings, and even buy things. The very fact that you and your home with Alexa can tell a, a, an AI what to order and have shipped to your house means we have made commerce easier. And it also means with the next level of AI, it may even be doing a better job at recommending or predicting our wants. I, I list this up. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen this. Uh, it started back in about 2021. In China now, they've got real-time AI that is actually making news broadcasts. What you're seeing on the screen here is a rendered human being that reads the state news to people uh, at night. And so we're seeing the idea now that we're going to have real-time AIs existing and even appearing as human beings. Uh, this is not science fiction. It's happening all around us. What are some of the implications? How much of our own thinking are we doing at this point? Is this going to make our lives better or worse? And how, how much control will companies have in our lives in terms of predicting our wants and needs as opposed to us predicting them ourselves? The apps that we're dealing with on our phones uh, these days, we all know there are security concerns and, and there are plenty of places to get them. It also means if you are a major brand, having an app can help you beat Google's, uh, Google's algorithm because if somebody likes your product enough, maybe they don't even need to use Google to get to you. And again, this is a very superficial overview of the architectures behind the internet. Why do we need to know about this stuff? Because we want to make sure we're leveraging it to the best of our ability, making good decisions for our companies, and also staying connected for us and our customers. I thank you for your time and attention, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.